All right, we are in a sermon series called The Firsts, unpacking the seven firsts of Jesus. These are uh, all from the book of Matthew, just giving us practical uh, ways to, to live out the vision of the river, in which we think is the vision of God. That is, we are here to know and love God and to grow and love people. And this is what Jesus talks about, what we must do to be his disciple. Different ways that we live out our, our walk with Christ and uh, show him our, our love and devotion to him. If you've missed any of them, uh, you can go on our website, theriverchurch.org, or go on Facebook, The River Church MN, and you can see any of the past messages of this series or any series uh, you're welcome to, but we're to live every day with God's kingdom in mind as our, as our top priority. Everything we say and do, all of our decisions, how we spend our time, money, uh, our relationships should be uh, with his kingdom and his righteousness in mind. That We seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then uh, living in God's kingdom is not an individual sport, it's a team sport. We don't, we don't do it alone. We don't go it alone. We don't do well alone. We do life with others. and it's not, We don't do it like the three stooges. They're always working against each other. You know, always. But more like the three musketeers whose motto is all for one and one for all. We do this together. We take the plank out of our own eye before we bring correction to another. And we, before we go to worship or serve the living God, we reconcile any rifts, any issues with brother, sister. So we, we first go be reconciled. So because our struggle, we walk with, in good relationships because our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people, but against powers and principalities, rulers of, of this dark world. And God calls us to take a stand against our one common enemy, which is Satan. So, I'm going to read out of uh, Matthew 12, starting in verse 22, and we will go from there. So, we're going to go to verse 33. So, Matthew 12, 22 says, Then they brought him a, to Jesus, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can rob his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Thank you that it matters to our lives today. Lord, thank you for your great love and your mercy to be here, to be with us, to love us first. And Lord, I pray you guide us through this passage, Lord. Help us to personalize it, to take it to heart as you intended, not just for people long ago, but for us right now. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as the youngest of five boys, had a couple sisters, one older, one younger, 
And so I'm the littlest, littlest boy. And uh, my older sister would feed me the dead flies from the windowsills. <laughs> she, she thought that was pretty fun to watch. She was about seven years older than me, six years older than me. Um, and that could be, that could explain a lot. In some, <laughs> but she was very instrumental in my coming to faith in Christ. So uh, she more than made up for it um, later in life. But I, I guess I just kind of rolled, whoops, I just, I kind of rolled with things. Um, hold on. I was, uh, you know, I got older brothers, older sisters, I just do what I'm told, and I don't know, I kind of went with it. Um, I learned that I was blamed for a lot of things growing, growing up. I didn't know it at the time, but my brothers would tell me the stories. Um, I learned that I was blamed for starting the toilet lid cover on fire. Remember back in the day when you actually had this like fabric around the toilet lid, you know, not the seat, but the lid? Everyone did it. I don't know. I don't do it anymore, but everyone. And apparently my brother started on fire and said, Steve did it. And I said, he's much older and wiser than me, so I guess I did it. I don't remember doing it. <laughs> I don't know how to light matches, but Okay. You know, and I was probably three, and he was probably five, you know, so, um, so I just kind of rolled with things, and, and uh, just, just, you know, believed the lie. That's what I, I believed the lie, Mike. So, <laughs> my brother Mike lives in Northfield with his wife, and a lot of times he tunes in, so he might be watching right now. Um, <laughs> That's how the enemy works, and not my brother Mike, but the devil. He gets us to believe lies, gets us to agree with him in things that he accuses us of doing, even though he knows that we didn't do that, right? That is not what we did. That's not who we are, but he likes to accuse us, and there's, there's only power if we agree with his accusations. And so, Bible, Bible quiz time, because... The Bible is a terrible thing to waste, right? Question, what are, what are some names and terms the Bible uses to describe the devil? Satan, the accuser, the enemy, murderer, father of lies, serpent. Say that again. Accuser of the brethren. Lucifer, morning star, yep, dragon, serpent, thief, liar, enemy, defeated foe, all these, a lot of different, a lot of different ways. <clears throat> and in this passage today, of all the names, all the terms that could have been used, Jesus calls him the strong man. Another, another name. He's clearly talking about the devil. In the context of what he's talking about, this strong man. You've got to first bind the strong man. So he's calling the devil the strong man. I want to come back to that description a little later, but I want to show you a video that I found that I think is uh, worth watching. So, and then we'll come back after that. So go ahead and kill the lights and show that video. Do you believe in the devil? Uh, do I believe in the devil? <laughs> I don't think so. Do you believe in the devil? No. No, I don't believe in the devil. I just never really bought into all that, I guess. I'm not sure if there's an actual, like, Satan or hell. I'd rather not believe in the devil. I'd prefer God. No, I don't think I believe in the devil. Can you tell me why not? Um, there's really nothing written or documented about it. How do you know he exists if there's nothing you can believe in God because, you know, there's the Bible and all that about it, but there's nothing about the devil. Tell me why not. I don't necessarily believe in God either. I mean, so there's no God, there's no devil. Actually, um, I don't really believe in God too, so why believe in devil if I don't believe in God? Do you believe in the devil? 
Yes, I believe in the devil. If it's a god, it's got to be a devil. Do you believe in the devil? Yes, I do. Not a physical devil. Do I believe in the devil? I believe in the presence of evil. I'm not sure if that's personified in the devil or not, but I do believe that there is evil present in the world. I guess the angel Gabriel was supposed to be Satan. Uh, he was turned into Satan, he was banished to hell, and uh, that's probably where evil came from, you know? What, what do you think, what do you think he looks like, if he's real? Um, scary looking. <laughs> Red, black, I don't know. Everyone has their image of what the devil looks like, which is, you know, this a creature with horns and you know everything but i don't think no one knows what devil looks like i guess the first thing that comes to mind is you know the big red guy with the pointy pointy tail and the horns and the pitchfork and stuff i don't really think he's got a form just like just darkness what is his purpose his purpose no that's a good question that i don't know it's like yin and yang there has to be a balance there so he's there to balance out the good that's out there i don't know because i think everything has its opposite and he's just the opposite of godliness and goodness how do you know the devil doesn't exist well i don't really know i mean <laughs> who really knows it's just uh you gather information around you and make your own decisions i don't know that's exactly i don't know if there is a god i don't know if there you know, is a devil. I don't know if there's hell, you know, it could be, could not be. How do you know there isn't a devil? I don't know that something like that doesn't exist. And while I'm willing to entertain the idea that it does exist, I don't personally believe that it exists. I'm not really a big religious person, so I don't know, I'm sorta like, eh, on the whole God devil deal. I'm just, I don't know. I'm not, I don't worry about it. How do you know there isn't a devil? Uh, I don't really like know that one doesn't exist, but to me there's just been there's been nothing to prove that there was some like outward force that caused people to do something. It was just themselves working for their own personal gain, I guess. So that doesn't concern you at all? Um I wouldn't say I wouldn't wasn't concerned, just I don't know, I have honestly better things to worry about. Well that grieves me that that's there's a lot of that on the street this is an example of spiritual blindness and biblical illiteracy which is which makes the devil's job much easier to deceive and to go about and and do what he is really good at doing but that's why we encourage reading your bible knowing what the bible says studying it with others uh, understanding who the devil is, because Jesus believes in the devil. Jesus talks a lot about the devil. He taught much about the devil's ways, and he wants us to be alert to, our, to the devil. So the context for this passage earlier, in, in, if you look around in chapter 12, um, the Pharisees were repeatedly angry with Jesus because he was doing things on the Sabbath that the Pharisees said that's wrong. Um, the disciples were walking in the grain fields and they were taking grain and rubbing it and eating it because they were hungry. They were eating grain. It was on the Sabbath. But rubbing grain is considered work and you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Um, having been in Israel, we were in this very fancy hotel, multi-floor hotel, fancy uh, elevators. And on the Sabbath, which is Saturday from from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., Sunday is a day. It's like Genesis talks about evening and morning. The, the measurement for a day started in the evening, went through midnight to 6 a.m. And uh, the, the elevators were programmed, pre-programmed to stop at every floor during that 24-hour period um, because pushing a button would be work, and you can't work on the Sabbath. So things like that, it's still to this day. And the Pharisees were angry, and then later on uh, in the chapter, uh, the man with the shriveled hand was in the synagogue, and Jesus said, stretch out your hand, and healed him, and said, how dare you? And it was that, that Jesus healing that man on the Sabbath, they plotted, they sat down and started plotting how they were going to kill Jesus for healing this guy's hand. And of course, uh, you know, so now, a demon-possessed man 
is brought to Jesus, who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him. And I like how the Bible just says, this man came to him, and Jesus healed him. So now he could both see and talk. It doesn't say how he healed him, doesn't describe any complicated, just, oh, that they brought this demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him. And so now he can see and talk. Very simple, easy-peasy, ho-hum, another, another day with Jesus. Um, and so all the people, it says, were astonished, astonished, and said, could this be the son of David? Could this be the son of David? They, they understood, the, the, it was understood by the Jews in the day that the Messiah, the Deliverer, the Savior, the Lord who saves, would come through the line of David, would be a descendant of King David. And even the book of Matthew starts with the genealogy, this is a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And uh, the common people recognized right away what the teachers of the law and the Pharisees missed, the experts missed. But the people didn't look into it more. They saw that, they recognized, could this be the son of David? Could this be the Messiah, the, the Savior? They didn't, they didn't follow through on it like, like me walking into a room with confidence and then get there and it's like, what was that again that I was? It's like, he's the son of David. Wait, what were we talking about? Ah, let's go eat. You know, and they just, they didn't follow through on this idea, this recognition based on his miracles and how he was having authority over the demonic. And they didn't, it was not long after that they were saying, crucify him. They joined with the Pharisees, crucify him. So, and the Pharisees hear about this talk, could this be the son of David, that they're, that they're murmuring and talking about having already been plotting to kill Jesus. They were already plotting. And so out of their own blindness and envy, they accused Jesus of driving out demons by the power of Beelzebub, which is clearly understood. Beelzebub comes from 2 Kings, referring to the pagan god of Ekron, meaning the Lord of the Flies, which I don't think my sister knew that part about the, the whole whole fly thing, but, um, but it was another way of saying the prince of demons, which is Lucifer, and it was just to insult Jesus. They couldn't deny that he healed him, that he delivered them, that this blind and mute man can now see and talk, um, so they try to slander him by connecting what he did and the power that he operated with to Satan, to Lucifer. This was a very serious charge, and it's interesting to know because practicing magic under the power of Satan was a capital offense in that day, punishable by stoning. So here they try to connect these Pharisees who were already plotting ways to kill him, try to connect him to Satan. And if he did use Satan's power, he was... Potentially, they're going to stone him. Very convenient charge to help with their plot. So, but Jesus, of course, pointed out the foolishness of uh, their accusation. A kingdom divided against itself won't stand. Nor can a marriage, nor can a church, nor can a company, nor can a country, nor can... So Satan divided against himself can't stand. And, and it was an easy argument. Um, but he said... But, but if I drive out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Because the kingdom of God is overcoming the kingdom of darkness. And that's why I love the simplicity of, of how Jesus said, how the scripture just says, and he healed them. It's not difficult for God to overcome the powers of darkness. The people saw that right away. They made the connection. They were connecting the dots. Could this be the son of David? Look how easily he just drove out the demonic, and now this guy who is blind and can't talk is seeing and speaking. And what we're seeing here in this, in this passage, we're seeing the crumbling, the unraveling of the kingdom of darkness that reigned since the Garden of Eden. This is a major, Jesus coming on the scene is a major 
turning point. Because it's important to understand, <clears throat> in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It was all very good. And he gave dominion of the earth to mankind. He said, let them rule. He made it all, set up the systems, and he said, let them have dominion over it. Be fruitful, multiply, take dominion, have authority over this, this world. And, and then they, they blew it. The devil came and deceived them into handing the authority over to the devil. They gave dominion over to the enemy. And his kingdom of darkness began to reign from that point on. Death, sin, sorrow, corruption, every dark thing started then. So I just want to look at the first point I want to make. The devil stole dominion of the world from mankind. He's a thief. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, as it says in John 10.10. 10. He stole dominion in the garden From Adam and Eve, and darkness descended on the earth. And the, the devil is referred to in Ephesians 2, 2 as the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Interesting that the airwaves, the internet, the TV, the media waves are, are absolutely polluted. Has some really good stuff there, has some really evil stuff in it. Um, and then 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says the devil is the God of this age. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the, king, or see the light of the gospel. The God of this age, another term for Satan. The God of this age, meaning there's, a, there's, a, there's term limits on, the, on Satan's power and authority. So he's blinded the minds of unbelievers so they can't see the light of the gospel. And then here they bring in a man who is demon-possessed, who is blind and mute. And Jesus says, not anymore. Not anymore. So the second, Jesus restored dominion back to mankind. He says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. John sixteen thirty three. Jesus entered the strong man's house and tied him up. He tied him up and he's still plundering the kingdom of darkness. Still, Jesus is still setting captives free. Right? He's still doing it. He's still doing it. And we need to be theologically accurate here. I wanna, that's why I said read your Bible, get to know, understand how this works. Jesus tied up the strong man. He didn't destroy him. Right? There's a big difference. He didn't destroy the devil yet. He tied him. He restricted him. Colossians says Jesus disarmed. He disarmed the powers of darkness. One of my favorite theological uh, movies is Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. You know, Hermie. He pulled all the teeth out of Abominable. Right? He didn't kill Abominable. He pulled his teeth. And the scripture, the psalmist says, shatter the teeth of your enemies, O God. Shatter their teeth. So they're still there. The devil is still there. He's still operating, but, his, but, but Jesus disarmed him. The book of Job teaches us the devil doesn't have free reign to do whatever he wants, wherever and whenever he wants. But in God's wisdom, which is hard for us to understand, it's a difficult question to answer. Why did God not just wipe him out early? Why did he let him operate? For whatever reason, we'll find out. But in God's wisdom, the devil is allowed to exist. <clears throat> so we need to understand the, the theology of God. God will, okay, so going back to God gave dominion to Adam and Eve, to mankind, and descendants. The devil stole it, is a thief. He deceived them out of it. God will not break his word because he said, let them rule. Let them have dominion. He won't come and say, oh, you blew it. Give me that back. Here, devil, go away. I'm taking it back. It's like, no, that would be breaking God's word by giving dominion to mankind. So it had to be through 
humanity. The solution for this problem had to come through humanity. And that's why the, the glorious news in the fullness of time, a virgin was found to be with child. A human. A human, someone from the human race. So the beauty of the incarnate one is that he has an earthly mother that makes him part of the human race, but he has a divine, it makes him man, but this divine miracle conception by the Holy Spirit makes him God. So he's a man, but he's God. So he doesn't have the sin nature. He's didn't get, he wasn't born with the inherited sin nature of Adam that the rest of us have. The rest of us that are unqualified, disqualified from being a substitute, Jesus was the only one qualified. And he came and as a human overcame the devil got the keys. This is the wisdom of God on display. He triumphed over the powers of darkness as a man. Perfectly sinless. Otherwise he would have deserved the same consequence we all deserve. But he, he was without sin. So how did Jesus tie up the devil? He, Jesus beat the devil first by just being born. Right? He came to earth. The God-man after he was born, the devil incited Herod to try to kill him off. He won over that. After his baptism, the Holy Spirit led him out in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The devil tried to deceive him into submitting to, to the devil, and he beat him out there with the word of God. It is written, it is written, just like we can overcome the devil. It is written. In so many ways and so many times throughout his life and ministry, and then Jesus conquered the final enemy, death, on the cross. He disarmed the devil and made a public spectacle of him, triumphing over his enemies. So he made, a, made the way so anyone who wants it now has the option to be called out of darkness and brought into his Marvelous light. Amen. The light shined in the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. Right? It could not overcome it. The darkness had reign, had rule for so long, but the light came and the darkness had no foothold. Colossians 1:13 says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of of the son he loves. So this is important theologically to understand what Jesus did legally. Legally. It's not just an emotion thing. It's not just a cool thing. It's God is a God of justice. He operates within rules and within laws. He, he lets the devil have some room to move, but he is not freely able to, to run. So in the fullness of time, Jesus came and darkness had to flee. And this is why Jesus came. One of the main reasons he came, to destroy the works of the devil. Right? The good news is Jesus gives us authority to do the same. We are handed that baton. So the third point I want to make, we're, we're given the same authority to overcome the devil. Overcome evil. Early in Jesus' ministry, he uh, gave authority to the 72 to go preach the gospel, lay hands on the sick, cast out demons. And they came back very excited that even the demons were subject to them. Luke 10, 19 says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. This is a transferred authority that Jesus gave, and these were, this was early on in his public ministry, these 72 that he sent out two by two, these were not, you know, theological geniuses. These weren't tried and true, tested followers of Christ's disciples. This was early on. And so don't, don't think that you, got, you don't know enough or you don't have what it takes like you have what it takes. You believe in Jesus? Is he Lord of your life? Trust him. 
Romans 12, 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't let evil run over you. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome it with good. And then the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18, 19, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore... Go and build the kingdom, push back the darkness, bring the light. With his authority, go undo the works of the devil and build his kingdom on the earth. So how do we we tie up the strong man? Quick points here. Another, my second half of the message here. A, letter A, understand his ways. Take a stand against him and Use faith. C, stand in faith. Stand in faith. Understand his ways. 1 Peter 5, 8, 9 says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. What's a roaring lion? It's not a biting lion. It's not a thrashing lion. It's not a killing lion. It's a roaring lion. It's got noise. It's got noise. It's got lies. It's got accusations. He's got no claws. He's toothless. He's got all bark and no bite. Right? He's looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. We, 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 we can't be ignorant about how the devil works. You have to understand. Read the Bible. Study it with others. Get in a small group. This video. It's like, do you believe in the devil? Nah. Because there's nothing written about him. There's no documented understanding of describing. It's like, wow, this is America. You know, this is the culture we live in. There's a ton written about him. Just right here. There's a lot right here. We need to understand how he works, how he doesn't work. Don't be ignorant about how the devil works. The devil primarily lies. He has only power for those who agree with his lies. And turn from whatever feeds the devil. We're called to repent of sin, repent of evil. Turn from things like horoscopes and tarot cards and all this stuff, but also unforgiveness, bitterness, resentments, holding offenses, having an attitude not godly, pornography, doubt, unbelief. All these things just feed the devil and they keep us ensnared and legally under his authority. It's, we invite the devil's authority into our life when we're dishonoring God and what he says is wickedness, right? And, and the devil, you know, it's, it's not a, uh, he, he comes by invitation only. He comes by invitation only. He cannot just pounce on on you aside from, I mean, he he will verbally do that, but we just say, get out of here. No. And we use the word of God against him. Say, no, that is not who I am. That is not how it works. And we resist him. And we stand firm in the faith. We don't toy with the entertainment and the things of this world and what the culture says is right and wrong. We go by what God says is right and wrong. We honor his word because it doesn't change. It's the same for our generation. It's the same for the first generation. It's the same. Lies are lies. Wickedness is wickedness. It doesn't doesn't matter what the culture is evolving into. That's not not God. So don't be ignorant of, of how the devil works. Understand how he works and don't grieve the Holy Spirit. So when the, when the devil says something like, your, your adult child will never come to faith because you blew it, you did whatever, it's like, don't agree with him. Tie him up. Bind him up by declaring God's word over the situation. Say, God said it's not will that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the salvation of God. And God says, let all who are weary and tired you know, come to me. And I will give you rest. 
Let them come to me. Let the little children come to me. God is always for me. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Declare that. When you're struggling and the thoughts are coming that your loved one won't come to Christ. If God is for me, who can be against me? And I'm going to keep standing for this person. And it's not looking good right now, but I don't go by what I see with my eyes. I go with the Word of God and what He says. Tie up the strong man. Tie him. Shut him down. Bind him. The devil gets credit for a lot of things that, you know, we say, well, does the devil make my vehicle break down? It's like, you know, the devil is responsible for the curse that's on the earth and things break down. Things will not last. It's a miracle that God had their clothing of the Israelites last 40 years in the wilderness. That was a miracle. It says it was a miracle. Because I can't get a pair of shoes to last maybe four years or something. Or a pair of jeans to last. God, does the devil cause this and that to happen? Well, indirectly, maybe. But is it the devil's credit that you're inconvenienced in some way? It's like, don't take it like that. This world has fallen. It's a, it's a messed up place. Don't give the devil credit for, for individual things that come your way. Say, God is for me. Who can be against me? Yeah. And the timing of things are in God's hands, not the devil's hands. Yeah. And let him be bigger and let the devil be smaller. Because he is a little speck compared to the power of God and the sovereignty of God. So don't, oh, the devil's just beating me up today. No, beat him up. No, you beat him up. Tell him what for. Rub the word of God in his face. Don't let him rub, you know, circumstances in your face. One of my uh, favorite movie pep talks was not from Braveheart or Gladiator. It's from The Incredibles, Edna Mode. Man, she could bring a pep talk when she's the hero. If you know the movie, the the wife finds out her husband's in trouble and she's like, oh, and the wife is a superhero and her husband's a superhero and her kids are superheroes. And the wife is talking to this, you know, this person, Edna Mode, and she's like, oh, my my husband's in trouble and I don't know what to do. And Edna jumps up on the desk and it's got a rolled up magazine and starts smacking her in the head. It's like, what are you talking about? She said, <laughs> said, go, confront the situation, fight, win. <laughs> As I love it. It's like this 30 second. It's like, yes, win. We have the king of glory, you know, who won the victory. He made a public spectacle over all his enemies defeating them, every sickness and disease. He won the victory over them. All the works of the devil, Jesus came to destroy. He destroyed them. And we're still feeling the effects, but fight, win over these things. Right? Confront the situation. Don't just take it. The devil is beating me up, my finances, my car, my... uh, Like, no... God is for you. Who can be against you? Bind the strong man. So stand in faith. Always, we always have to mix faith in with whatever situation. Even the word of God. Can't just say, oh, the word of God and not mix faith in with it. 1 John 5, 4 and 5, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Remember Jesus said, don't fear, take heart, I've overcome the world. And now he's saying we can overcome the world. Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Every sin is forgiven by God. Jesus overcame it. We in Christ overcome it as well when the devil comes at you with mental confusion or fear or anxiety or worry about things which he is very good at 
very experienced at, tie him up by faith and declare the truth of God. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind. Like, I don't have it all figured out, nor do I have to have it all figured out. But I know who does have it figured out. And I'm standing on his word that he who is for me, he who began a good work, is faithful to complete it, no one who can be against me. Just have that, the word of God hidden in your heart and, and call it up and mix it with faith. And tell your feelings what to feel. Tell your feelings what to do. Align. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? David says. And he had a lot of reasons to be downcast. Put your hope in God. He's telling his own soul, put your hope in God. Over and over, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? And he's remembering, he's recalling, he's fighting. He's fighting that inner battle that's going on with the enemy saying, put your hope in God. Remember his word. Remember Jesus who died on the cross. Remember Jesus who made a public spectacle of all of his enemies. And yes, we live in a fallen world and there's difficult, horrible things that happen in this life. But God is on the throne. And he's working in all of it. And your story might be another story like Joseph who was betrayed by his brothers, who was sent into slavery, who was banished. His dad thought he was dead. His father, who he loved, thought he was dead. His younger brother. I mean, over and over, falsely accused Potiphar's house. But your story might be a Joseph story. That some horrible things are happening along the way, but God is for you. This wasn't the devil. It wasn't the devil's credit. For Joseph's story, it was God's credit to save the known world, to influence many for God. Tie the devil up by faith. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Doesn't matter what valley of the shadow of death I, I walk through. And Jesus said, he who is not for me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. There's no neutral ground in this setting here. There's no neutral ground. Oh, I just got to stay out of trouble. I just got to stay out of sin. I'm just so glad I'm not addicted to alcohol anymore. That's the goal. It's like, that is not the goal. That's a, that's a temporary benefit. The goal is for you to take ground. Gather with Jesus. Fight with him. Fight for him. Fight with him. If you're not, and Jesus says, if you're not with me, then you're against me. By not being purposefully for Jesus, Jesus is saying, you are for the enemy. You are for Satan. You are living for the devil if you're not actively pursuing the kingdom of God and his glory. And I, you know, that's, Welcome to the river. I'm glad you're here. I hope you get to know us well, but my, my goal is not to befriend you. My goal is to be your pastor and call you up to the kingdom of God and righteousness. And because the day will come when you will look in his eyes. You will look in the eyes of Jesus, the lamb who was slain from the foundations of the world. And I, I don't want you to say we had a great time at the river. It was really cool. And not know who this one is that you're looking at. But to know him, to know him personally, to know him intimately, to know him accurately, to know him accurately by his word, not by our culture or what makes us comfortable with our sexual identity or our whatever. It's like, no, we're going to stick with the word of God and promote his kingdom and his righteousness. And that's where we're going. The mission hasn't changed. And it's not easy. But if we're not for Jesus, then we're against Jesus. 
And he says, every sin and blasphemy will be given or forgiven against the Son of Man, but any word spoken against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven in this age or in the age to come. And I don't think that's saying because we've gone too far, and I know Christians at times say, I think I've committed the unpardonable sin because I've cursed God. I've spoken against the Holy Spirit. And, and many, and I would agree, have said, if you have a, a struggle with that, that's an indicator that there's, you don't have a problem with that. If you're struggling with maybe you've, you've gone too far against God, then in all likelihood, you haven't gone too far because your heart is still tender, still sensitive, and it bothers you, and God is for you. And anything spoken against the Lord is forgivable. What, it, what I think it's saying is anyone who speaks against the, the, the drawing of the Spirit of God in your heart to the point where you reject it for so long, so permanently reject the work of God in your heart, then he's saying there is no forgiveness. There's no other way because you're cutting yourself off from the only lifeline that you have uh, into this next life with God. And so it's so important to not resist God, not say, oh, I'm so sinful, I've done it. You can't help me, God. You aren't able to save me. I think that's what he's, Jesus is talking about. That's the only unforgivable, unpardonable sin is the sin of permanently rejecting God's offer of life in his name. Because there's no other name given to man by which we must be saved. So I'm just going to close with this. I mean, we just, too often we believe the liar and agree with the thief. Steve did it. I must have done it. I don't remember doing it, but I must have done it if you say so. Devil. When the, when the devil says something that goes against God's word, disagree with him. Say, I am not a toilet seat pyro. <laughs> Say it with me. I am not a toilet seat pyro. <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> I didn't do that. Okay? Of course, we all know that we have started figurative toilets on fire. Right? We've all done things we regret. But don't let the devil accuse you of something that is under the blood of Jesus and was defeated on the cross once and for all. And it was taken as thrown into the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west. And remembered no more by God. Don't let the devil remind you of something that God has chosen to, chosen to forget. Amen. Jesus gave his life for your freedom and forgiveness. Don't refuse it. Don't argue with God and say, no, the devil is doing this. The devil is too strong, God. Look what he's done to my marriage. Look what he's doing to my circumstances. Look what he's done to my finances. Like, no. Look what Jesus has done. Look what Jesus has provided. Look what he provides according to his riches and glory. He will provide for all your needs. He will never let the righteous be forsaken or their children left begging for bread. Any relationship can be healed. Every, every circumstance can change. And I, so this, this is, I'm, I'm talking, and this is, this is Sunday morning in a little bit. We could talk about this for months of the intricacies and the fine-tuning. The devil has real consequences. Adam and Eve blew it and were banished from the garden. What they were supposed to allow, be alive to this day and enjoying, there was consequences. The devil wins battles, no doubt. But keep fighting. Keep standing. Keep believing. Don't give up. So we need to first tie up the strong man and get back what he stole. It says tie him up and then plunder him. Take back your marriage. Take back your circumstances. Take back the victory that 
that Jesus died for. Take the family members back that have fallen away. Take the joy of your salvation back that the devil stole. Take your peace back that the devil stole. And know that God is in control, not the twisted world systems that we know of, that you see in the the news. Take back the wasted years that you gave over to the devil. Make up for it. Take back financial health. Take back the personal promises that God, that you believe gave to you about something that you may have just died to and let it go. Take them back. I think it's no coincidence that it was a blind and a mute man. Jesus came so that we could see his kingdom, to open our eyes to see his kingdom, and he gave us a voice to tell the world about it. What the devil steals, Jesus restored. The devil hates you, wants you destroyed. He he is lying to you all the time. And if you don't have the word of God hidden in your heart, you're just going to take it. You're going to believe it. It's going to sound so convincing. It's going to sound so rational, so reasonable, and so justifiable. And if he can get you to agree, he's got you right where he wants you. Agree with God. Amen. Let's stand up. If there's something, and we have a prayer team here that's ready. If you want to, I'm going to close in prayer. People will be up here to, to pray with you. If uh, Sometimes it's good to agree with someone over a situation and declare it and help. Ask for help about what scriptures you can stand on. Maybe you're, you're new to learning what the Bible says about marriage and finances and whatever the issue might be, forgiveness, relational health. Come up here and, and let's agree together to pray over you for, for whatever the need might be. I just want to make time and invite you up here. So, Lord, we thank you. And I'll, I'll close it out and you'll be dismissed, but those who would like to come forward and then the prayer team, you see how many people come, just join me up here, join my wife and I up here, and Paul and Kay here. So Lord, we just thank you for your, your word, God. Thank you for the victory. Thank you for the instructions from your word about how we are to overcome the enemy, the evil one as well, just like you did by your word, by what you did on the cross for us. You made the way where, where there was no way that we could do it on our own. Lord, help us to walk in the, the victory that you provided and not listen to the evil one. Not give him any more time. Thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness, for your wisdom in calling us as your sons and daughters to Stand with you. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, none of this matters. You're susceptible to the enemy. And it's, it's, you need to submit to Jesus. You need to give your life to Christ. You need to come under his authority by faith. And, uh, and you are given the right to become a child of God if you just give your life to him. So I just want to start there and invite you to put your faith in Christ, crucified, buried, resurrected, the one who made a way. Lord, just bless our, our day. God, help us to walk with you in the victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.